Okay. Morning, everybody, um, and welcome to our second uh, Practitioners Series event. Um, obviously, we are all still remote, um, so we're doing this in the webinar format. We are praying to God that the third and fourth could possibly be done uh, physically, but we're not entirely sure at this point in time. Hope everybody is keeping well. Uh, today, we are doing a, another update from uh, our last webinar uh, in relation to insolvency. Um, the last one Angus did was in relation to MVLs. We're now unfortunately doing the other side of that, which is the bad side, which um, Angus will run through um, examinership schemes of arrangement creditors liquidation and personal insolvency solutions i suppose at the at this point in time with all the government supports in place these really haven't become active and uh, we are unfortunately anticipating that when the plug is pulled by all the government supports there will be problems um i think what clients will need to know at this stage of what they're at that stage is what their options are and um, hopefully it won't be too difficult a, a, a downturn for certain sectors. I know 80% of the sectors that we are dealing with at the moment are all going fine, 20% uh, being the hospitality, um, leisure, um, they are struggling and retail are struggling, but they might bounce back, they might bounce back, we just don't know. But what we are doing today is we're just giving you a prep in relation to the options available to clients in relation to what they can do. Following on from that, we'd have Dara Kelly, a partner, corporate finance partner based out of our Limerick office, who will uh, give an, uh, an update in relation to the, the funding environment at the moment. Um, uh, I suppose, as I mentioned there earlier, the, the government are, kind of underwriting everything at the moment. There is a lot of cash washing around. We do anticipate that that will stop uh, once the once the economy reopens. Um, when that does happen, there will be a necessity for banking um, and fundraising, which is kind of carrying on at the moment anyway. Um, and Dara will also give an update in relation to what we know uh, in relation to Ulster Bank. We don't know a lot at the moment, but just in relation to what they might be thinking. Uh, the further sessions that we are hoping to do later on in the year uh, will be kind of more tax based um, in relation to succession planning, preparing for sale. Uh, we also are going to do one in relation to a, a, a significant one in relation to um, tax incentives. Um, between the R&D capital allowances, there are a lot of incentives out there at the moment that can't that people aren't utilising fully. Uh, and just to give clients and youth practitioners an idea of what our capacity and our firepower in relation to what we can do for clients there. Um, also, we'll be following on that with pension and tax revenue audits and forensics and cyber. Um, we are anticipating as well more revenue activity. Uh, they have been told to wind up um, we know that in relation to a number of dormant revenue audits that are revenue audits that we would have had ongoing or have ongoing at the moment that kind of paused for a few months based on the uh, pandemic have reactivated and the revenue are beginning to get a bit more aggressive with us in relation to some of them to get stuff solved. Uh, so we will be put, providing advice in relation to that um, in the next few months. The series presenters, uh, Dara and Angus, are presenting today. Dara, as I mentioned, is a corporate finance partner based on Limerick. Angus is an advisory partner based on Galway. It's the new world we live in. Um, we can provide those services now completely remotely. Um, Angus and Dara have both um, joined me in relation to the local work um, to take over the corporate finance and the um, local advisory uh, and are down on a regular basis when pandemic um requirements allow so the rest of the team there will come in the next few uh, webinars or you'll come to meet them between brian cronin james mcmahon on the tax side uh, and mike harris on the cyber um so i what i will do now is i'll just pass over to angus who will go through the insolvency and restructuring what we would like is that if there are questions that the questions will be dealt with at the very end and um, the question function is down the bottom of the screen please put your questions in and we will have a wrap up at the very end but i think it's it's more efficient to do them all at the one time at the very end so over to you angus thanks very much uh mick and um i think you all know who we are at the moment um so I kind of wanted to um, 
I suppose, I suppose we, we, we had a title there, company-led examinership schemes of arrangement liquidation and creditor-led liquidation receivership. And I suppose I wanted to kind of get the angles of, of who are you and where are you coming from? So are you coming from the, the shareholder side, the, the, the company side, the, the director side, if you like, uh, or are you coming from the creditor side? And I suppose the, the, the problem, or it's, it's not a problem, it's a good thing, but all the, the statutory and um, formal arrangements that we have uh, uh, in terms of liquidation, examinership, uh, receivership, um, can be used by, by, by both sides, by both uh, creditor and shareholder. So the, the concept of shareholder friendly would you know, generally be, be kind of positioned towards examinership schemes of arrangement and that they're kind of pro shareholder and all about the business and the creditor, well, you know, the, the, the creditor maybe is, is, is less of, a, of an importance uh, in it, more the focus is on the, on the, the, the business side and, and, and the director led. Uh, and, you know, uh, petitioning the wind up by revenue or whoever in a liquidation is clearly, a, 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 an, a, as is receivership in terms of grabbing security and repossession is very much a, a creditor led, led focus. But I suppose the key thing with, with all of them, including examinership and, and, and liquidation, they can, examinership can be, can be creditor led as well as director led. Uh, liquidation can be creditor led as well as uh, director led. And, and receiverships certainly uh, on acting for secured creditors previously I've, I've facilitated a number of sales even back to um, back to business owners and and, and shareholders so um, you know sometimes we we, we, we we feel guilty of, of falling into camps about preconceived notions of what of what liquidation or, or, or receivership is but I'd ask you to keep a, keep an open mind on them and the, the, the reason I suppose I want to touch on the, the formal um, uh, insolvency and, uh, and restructuring procedures rather than the, the, so much the informal ones is that th the formal procedures are, are really a backdrop. They're really a, a base. So it, it, it allows you to set the conversation and, you know, God willing, you know, you you won't. Depending on the scenario you're in, you won't need a formal option. That an informal option and negotiation, you know, with with creditors and stakeholders, is possible to to produce a, to produce a satisfactory outcome. Um, but it's always important to understand the fallback. And look, generally, uh, liquidation even for the formal options is a is a, a, an important fallback particularly the priority of where creditors sit and that's almost your base um you know that everybody knows where they might stand in a in a, in, a, in a liquidation um and then go from there and improve the situation for for everyone so in in that respect i, I wanted to just do a recap on the the cvl which is the most common insolvent liquidation now these are not mvls i'm not talking about them today completely different solvent process this is the world of uh, the world of insolvency where um people are not getting getting paid uh, it's insolvency so the the test their inability to pay debts as they fall due okay now others say well look there's the there's the balance sheet test which means that your liabilities are more than your assets but if you have the support of your creditors you know and they're not calling in their debt then that's not insolvency you know so really the bigger focus is inability to pay debts as they fall due you know we saw a number of property companies with huge debts continuing over the years in the past in the past decade were they insolvent? Were they not? Well, the debts hadn't been hadn't been called in, and I think particularly in this crisis, that's a very important thing to to look at because, you know, we have situations now where the balance sheet in those sectors that Mick spoke about, um, hospitality, retail, uh, entertainment, travel, um, the balance sheets are really in quite poor shape for a number of of those businesses. Why? 
asset values are are depressed. Um, revenue debt has been has been warehoused. Um, bank bank debt has been pushed back, uh, more taken on. A significant redundancy liability from from the temporary layoff that has been extended again and again and again, again to the end of this month, but, <clears throat> but beyond. Uh, so so all those liabilities have built up, yet we're not seeing formal insolvencies on on any wide scale uh, at the moment, um, because there is cash coming in and there is not sufficient creditor pressure out there to to force a situation. So if you're a landlord or a or or, or a bank, you might say, well, um, what's to be gained from putting a hotel or a pub or a bus company uh, under pressure now when um, we can't actually get a better get a bit get, get a better situation but I suppose the the day will come um, when the supports are unwound um, when uh, creditors start jockeying for position in terms of trying to get paid whether they're revenue landlords etc I'd imagine at this stage, possibly many many trade creditors are are are, are up to date because of the uh, the, the windfall cash uh, coming coming in from 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 central government. Um, so I suppose we need to be we need to be ready for that day. And 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 what does it what does it look like? You know, some businesses will be able to, uh, you know, will have will have done their homework, will have managed the 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 cash coming in, uh, and will be able to negotiate their deals on an informal basis. Others may need some kind of formal uh, support to be able to protect the business and to and to trade on. We did a number of creditors voluntary liquidations last year, and a very significant number, I think about half of the creditors voluntary liquidations involved a sale of the business out of liquidation. So the business survived the liquidation of the company, which again, you know, if somebody says liquidation to you, you think, right, that's 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 bury the bury the company, bury the business time. Um, but liquidation can be used to um, to deal with the creditor situation and carry the business with or without employees out into a, a new entity to um, to continue on. Um, the CVL does not involve, it's not a court process. Um, there's a creditors meeting called and the company directors start the process as soon as they're of the view that the company is insolvent. Okay, And again, important to take advice as to at what point do the directors call the insolvency of the, of the company. Um, it's kicked off by way of an ordinary 51% resolution by the shareholders to wind up the company. So the composition of the shareholders is important in terms of the decision uh, to go ahead with, with liquidation. Advantages are the control that the company directors have they, and that they can also just um, pass on the um, pass on the liquidation to uh, to a liquidator to do with all the company creditors. With regard to the company creditors, at the creditors meeting, creditors can nominate an alternative liquidator. Now you might say, what's the difference? All liquidators are independent, but there's a certain nuance as to controlling the process. And you know, certainly revenue have a record of putting their own liquidators into companies. And you know, they might they might have a different uh, nuance or a different uh, approach to a, a liquidator appointed by the by the company. So that's just just something to watch out for. Um, the liquidator then can make the application to the department of enterprise um, uh, to get employee entitlements paid. So there's a redundancy fund and an insolvency fund that covers um, areas of wages, um, holiday pay, a statutory minimum notice. So, you know, sometimes the employees are gunning for a liquidation so that they can, they can get paid. And you're trying to manage the situation where, um, where, where, where you've racked up significant liabilities in the, in the company. Some might be accusing you of not calling the insolvency soon enough um, and putting the historic problems of the business behind and perhaps starting again, as I said, you know, kind of half of the liquidations we, <clears throat> we deal with uh, involve, um, involve continuation, um, you know, either, either connected parties or 
uh, or, or new purchases of the business. Disadvantages are there is a report required to the Office of the Director of Corporate Enforcement on the conduct of the directors, whether they acted honestly and responsibly in the affairs of the business. <clears throat> in a small minority of cases, that might lead to restriction or an even smaller minority to disqualification. But really, the, the courts look uh, favorably towards entrepreneurs and, and company directors generally, I have to say, and it is absolutely in the minority if there is something untoward done by the by the directors that restriction follows and restriction is a requirement to put just over 60,000 euro share capital into any company uh, of which the director wishes to be a director of in the future so it's it's kind of putting a a buffer of cash into share capital for future directorships going forward so you know restriction is 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 relatively mild sanction but um, at the same time, uh, reputationally, it's, uh, it's absolutely to be avoided. Um, other disadvantages, unsecured creditors are going to get burnt and spoke about the reputational um, issues there. Um, in terms of um, a court uh, liquidation, not, not generally kind of flipping to the, the creditor side. So most court liquidations are instigated by disgruntled creditors and even though it's not supposed to be used as a as a way to rustle up payment of a of a, an outstanding debt it, it kind of is used as a as a debt collection um, but i suppose if you if you if you push and push towards the end of the cliff um, you know you might get paid just before you push uh, the the animal or the person over the cliff. Once they're over the cliff, it's too late at that stage. It's in liquidation, so you're not going to get paid. So it's a it's a high risk way of 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 trying to get paid, and it does carry some some costs. So it's not an easy one for a creditor to uh, petition um, to petition a liquidator the company. But it it does happen, and it will happen much more uh, towards the end of the year, either by way of revenue. Or, uh, or other other creditors. Um, but it could be a member shareholder. I spoke to you before about the shareholder composition of the company. You know, sometimes it's not possible to get that 51% uh, resolution. Um, and, and, you know, there's, there's, there's this creditors voluntary liquidation notice period of, of 10 days. Maybe it's not possible to wait 10 days. So there'd want to be good reasons to present to a judge where, a member shareholder uh, applies to court for for an, an immediate appointment of a of a liquidator to a company, but it's it's absolutely possible. Uh, you just need to set out the the circumstances, and the the concept of the friendly creditor is there also to maybe assist in in putting a company into liquidation to get the necessary court protection from from creditors, and you know more often in that scenario to facilitate a sale of the business out. Uh, once the, thankfully now they've changed the process, the court liquidations do not involve the court examiner and countersigning every check, um, something I, I, I don't remom remember from, uh, very, very fondly. Uh, at, at the first available meeting, we, we, we effectively changed the court liquidation into a creditor's voluntary liquidation and proceed with the liquidation without the input of the court and um, the for a written demand by a creditor now the the minimum is 50,000 euro was 10,000 euro pre-covid uh, so that is a, a change that uh, that the, the government made during the during the covid period i suppose make it less easy for creditors to to wind up businesses as a result of uh, of companies as a result of covid again the advantages here the petitioner is really in the driving seat in terms of nominating the liquidator. Okay, so you can see why revenue kind of like to put their own liquidator into company sometimes. That 10 day notice period not required. If you have shareholder majority challenges, then you know this is an application to court, not a, not a shareholder resolution. Um, if you want to sell the business, and I suppose are concerned about moving the employees over to uh, the, the purchaser, well, court liquidation effectively kills 2P. Um, so it, it means that employees cannot then turn around to the new purchaser and look for their jobs back. Now, I have to say, I find most employees want the redundancy um, and, and are happy with the, with the tax-free payout. Um, but 
court liquidation brings some certainty around the the 2p issue that it doesn't transfer otherwise it's very similar to the the cvl just want to touch on provisional liquidation so oftentimes um, the judge will appoint a provisional liquidator with a hearing date to follow a week or 10 days later okay it's kind of a hiatus position where liquidation clauses in contracts are often not uh, crystallized okay so it may be possible then for the provisional liquidator to do a quick sale of the business as a going concern without triggering those um those liquidation clauses in the in the contract we did it in the last recession a few times but you'd want to really have purchasers lined up enabled to be able to do a quick accelerated m a deal um in terms of setting the scene for negotiations and also to drive liquidation or, or, or examinership, the statement of affairs is necessary and it's different to a normal balance sheet in that it's done on a waterfall basis. Okay, it details the assets and liabilities uh, on both a going concern basis and a, and a winding up basis in an insolvency waterfall uh, format. Um, and it's accompanied with a list of the company's creditors for a, for a creditor's voluntary liquidation. The examinership statement of affairs is not dissimilar. It forms part of the independent expert report. And there's a different format again for the court liquidation, a somewhat outdated format, but again, kind of follows a, a waterfall format, which reflects the priority of claims in the liquidation. At the top of the list is the secured creditor. That's the mortgage from the bank generally, often over, over property. You might say, well, look, invoice discounting um, is ownership of book debts by a third party. So it doesn't actually fall as an asset of the company, even though it might have been sitting on the balance sheet. So it's, it's effectively like a secure creditor, but it's, it's really the, the assets are taken off the balance sheet by the invoice discounter or the, the leasing company who might own the leased assets. So it doesn't quite fall into the priority of claims, but effectively it's up there as a secured creditor. After that come the costs of the, of the liquidator and, and, and his team and the winding up. So liquidator needs to agree any costs if, if um, with the secured creditor, if the liquidator is to manage the sale of that, that asset. Next up is the super pre preferential credit, which is the employee share of PRSI that ranks ahead of the other preferential creditors, which are, um, which are more revenue liabilities up to, up to 12 months. Um, most of the employee entitlements generally, uh, there are certain rules around what, what's captured, but um, you know, generally employees get paid most of what they're owed and, and commercial rates. After that, then you have the floating charge or, or debenture, which kind of is a bank, generally a bank security that mops up any, any other assets of the, of the company to the detriment really of the, of the unsecured creditors. It's important that creditors know where they sit, sit in the process. And look, recently we've we kind of on, on Zoom calls or, or Teams calls, we throw up a, an Excel format CVL statement of affairs and we start plugging in figures uh, to see what the what the waterfall looks like. And it's and it's very helpful in terms of working out what the value of the assets are, what the position of the creditors are, what they're most likely to take in terms of <clears throat> in terms of a deal, because it is your fallback position. Um, <clears throat> from a creditor perspective, though, there's um, some some handy kind of defenses that can be put in place. Um, retention of title, I often think is not given the respect it deserves. By, by creditors can be very useful in terms of retaining title to goods that are that are supplied. Also, and particularly in the in the construction space, but also in in property, hotels, um, etc. Certification and warranty can be can be very useful in terms of handing over certification only when paid in in full. So there's abilities for for creditors to kind of jockey uh, for better position even in a liquidation or, or receivership or examinership uh, scenario. And more often than not, personal guarantees are not captured in, in the insolvency process. So, you know, while we have limited liability for companies, unfortunately, personal guarantees overleap that. And um, 
and you know really at that stage then you're looking at the personal situation we'll touch on personal uh, insolvency procedures later on in terms of examership then you know the key here is to preserve the company okay why well the company you know may well have contracts that are of value that are in the name of the company if you go into liquidation while well, there's ability to sell the business and preserve parts of the business it is quite destructive because the word liquidation is clauses in contracts you know it has impacts on staff etc so if you can keep the company intact rather than trying to sell the business out of a liquidated company well there has to be an advantage there in in many cases so the idea here is a bit of surgery where we bring in uh, cash into the top half of the balance sheet, an investment to assist with, with, with working capital, pay the, the costs of the examination and to, to deal with a scheme of arrangement for creditors, <clears throat> coupled with a write-off of amounts owed to creditors uh, on the bottom half of the exam of the balance sheet. So effectively, you're correcting the balance sheet of the company, and you are freeing up, um, you, or you're assisting with working capital through the investment into the company, and you're also using the examination procedure to renegotiate onerous contracts such as leases which you can do under threat of repudiation of leases and changes by agreement to work practices and other contracts that the company might have entered into but are dragging it down and examination is really a one-off opportunity to deal with all these issues correct the balance sheet correct the the p l going forward if there is a viable business and why that why might might you use it uh, well, there might be legacy issues, <clears throat> you know, like COVID, a big a big hit to the to the balance sheet, or a, a credit crunch like we had ten years ago. Um, there might be onerous contracts now that are were valid at the time they were entered into, but but really do not make sense going forward and need to be gotten out of, all leading to a broken balance sheet, issues with landlord leases, and what we want to do here is protect the business and employment. That's what examination was designed for. So the key characteristics then for success are the words reasonable prospect of survival. So in the independent experts report, it's one of the key questions asked of the accountant there uh, for producing the report to the judge is, is there a reasonable prospect of survival of the business? Does it have an ability to attract sufficient investment if there is a scheme of arrangement with creditors and subject to other changes in, in owner's contracts? etc. So what we want to see is a good business trapped in a, a broken a broken balance sheet and be able to show positive cash flows going forward subject to the, the changes that can be achieved in examination. Um, so we talked about the independent experts report, the viability and appropriateness of the, the process. The examiner has a non-executive role, so the directors will continue doing what they're what they're doing. Um, and, and there's core protection given, so it allows a bit of a breather from creditors who are trying to jockey for position and trying to get paid, that actually there's a bit of time now extended to 150 days during COVID, 100 days was the max before, uh, 150 days to allow a bit more time to get a deal over the line. Um, not all examinerships are successful. We saw there with, with Keatings there recently went into liquidation a deal could not be done even with the 150 days. The disadvantages, um, biggest disadvantage is the cost. Uh, quite costly in terms of going into court, generally would be into the into the high court. You know, two sets of lawyers, one for the company, one for the examiner, the examiner, the independent expert, in and out of court, uh, quite, a, quite a costly process, easily 100,000 euro. Um, to 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 deal with uh, to deal with an examination, you have a lot of court scrutiny. You know, you come to the court with with clean hands, and you know the judge is scrutinising everything. Are you a good candidate <clears throat> or not? So, um, so so really, you know, if there's if there's problems with revenue returns, if there's problems with other creditors, they're going to be highlighted in court. And you know, if creditors aren't happy with how things are going, they might influence the judge to say, look. It's not an appropriate candidate now here for examination. Um, there is a requirement for investment. The judge wants to see new money coming in. 
Okay, that's one of the more recent things. We we did examinerships, successful examinerships in the past that involved no new money, but I, I don't think we'd get away with that anymore. Um, quite high qualification requirements are set out in the in the independent uh, experts report and and that opinion required also in an effort to address the cost issue uh, examinership light was brought in a number of years ago uh, you can go to the circuit court now it's available for smaller companies and the idea was to lower costs i think it is lowering costs eventually before it wasn't because you know the circuit court judges didn't really understand the process so well uh, but i think things have improved there and it is certainly being used much more as a way of reducing the costs. I think we're circulating the slides afterwards, so this will give you an idea of the process in and out of court, if it's not working into liquidation or the creditors, secured creditors might appoint a receiver. The protection continues, uh, uh, meetings with creditors to vote the, um, the, the scheme of arrangement through if that's confirmed by creditors back into court to look for confirmation and then a court order approving the plan writing off the creditors and you know adopting any new arrangements going forward and that's a successful examinership once that's done uh, if not it drops into liquidation uh, at, at some point in the in the process at least the protection is withdrawn and um, in terms of the order priorities they're a little bit more significant in examinership. Uh, there may be some transaction fees. The examiner's costs actually rank ahead of even the secured creditor, the fixed charge holder. So you'll notice that that's, um, that's different to the liquidation situation. This is, in a, I suppose, a failed exam examinership then. So I suppose you have your receiver's fees, fixed charge holder. There's ability to have some credit expenses certified during the examinership if they're deemed to be absolutely necessary. So they, they rank ahead of even other costs um, that are that are expended in the or accrued during the during the liquidation. And then you're into the normal super preferential preferential. So there's a few more priorities there. The net effect of this, I suppose, is that if you have a failed examinership, you have the costs of the examiner on top of the costs of the liquidator. So it's effectively doubling up on the costs, which is uh, certainly um, an, a negative for creditors. So you can see why some creditors might not like the idea of examinership because they think Usher is just going to fail and you're just burning up cash unnecessarily with costs and prolonging the inevitable. Um, we have the concept of scheme of arrangements now since 2014 and the legislation is, is, is much improved. Um, uh, the advantages are um, that it, it doesn't have the same kind of costs, um, you know, it doesn't have the same kind of scrutiny, uh, and you can bring a plan into, into court. You can even get um, some, some court protection from creditors in terms of a moratorium. Um, but the downside is the threshold from creditors is much, much higher than examinership, where examinership is 51% in only one class of creditors. Um, uh, schemes of arrangement are 75% of all creditors, okay? And it doesn't have the same kind of toolbox in terms of impact on secured creditors or ability to repudiate uh, leases. Um, so it doesn't have the same punch as examinership. Um, the thresholds for voting are higher, but in many cases, and we thought really for, for COVID related problems, the scheme of arrangement could be, could be very useful because the costs are significantly less. Um, it's only been used one or two times um, in insolvency, uh, but we think it'll be used an awful lot more and worth exploring. So to touch on receivership, receivership really is very different to the processes that we've, that we've spoken about before. It's very much much more tends to be a creditor-led process. Now it can involve a, a sale back to uh, to the the previous owners. Um, you know, the the owners could be the the creditors with security as well. Um, you, you sometimes see that, but generally, uh, in most cases, it's the bank. Okay, and it's very much repossession. Okay, which is the way to look at lifting secured assets out of a company. Okay, or out of personal ownership in terms of a fixed charge only. Okay, so the receiver's role is very much to take possession of 
charged assets, okay, and to realize those assets for the benefit of the secured creditor. If there's anything left over after that sale and after the costs, then it trickles down according to the priority of claims in a company uh, insolvency, okay. Um, in a personal situation, any surplus goes back to the um, back to the, the the personal owner and personal borrower of the asset. How would it happen? Well, the debenture loan might be in in arrears. There's some kind of a default um, or threat of threat of liquidation. Often, where the relationship has broken broken down, and it's an attempt by the lender to call in the loan and get paid. Um, I think we're all kind of more knowledgeable on receiverships now after the last 10 years. It's been so, so many of them. Um, before I pass on to Dara, um, I wanted to touch on the personal insolvency world. Um, over the last seven years, we have a suite of uh, personal insolvency legislation that has come in uh, and is available for, for, for use and really helps a situation where with person insolvency historically was a very outdated bankruptcy process, which was used as an absolute threat to get payment, a very difficult process to actually get into, uh, but an awful process to be in as a, as a bankrupt debtor. Um, so if, you're, if your client is a, a sole trader, uh, is not incorporated. Um, you know, many pub owners uh, don't seem to be incorporated from what I'm seeing at the moment, which is very interesting from this perspective. And we've had a number of, re recently a number of sole traders uh, who have availed in particular of the debt settlement arrangement, which can be up to five years of paying dividends to creditors from future income. But more often than not in a, in a sole trader situation involves a lump sum coming from, in inverted commas, a rich auntie or outside of the estate in maybe 20, 30,000 euros, something like that as a bullet payment and then wrapped up with a creditor's meeting and approval and then confirmation by the court of the debt settlement arrangement. Okay, so really important piece of, of, of legislation uh, there that I think will be used more and more for sole traders and people dealing with those personal guarantees that we spoke about earlier. The person solvency arrangement of PIA, very similar, but involves secured debt. So if there's a secured property, uh, you would use this process, but very similar bullet payments also, also possible. Um, the courts have improved their stance around protection of the family home. So there's a few interesting angles around that on the, on the PIA. The bankruptcy process is much improved from historically that the term keeps reducing down. However, the family home is still at risk and really the DSA and the PIA, if they can be pulled off, are much better processes than, than bankruptcy in, in general. But don't forget the personal uh, options available for clients in difficulty. They really can tidy up um, their personal situation arising out of a, a business collapse. Um, so at that, uh, Dara will unmute. And um, I think we're leaving questions to the, to the end, uh, if you don't mind. And I am going to hand back, um, well, or maybe I have handed back control. And maybe Dara, do you have control of the slides now? Yes, I do. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is, thanks Angus and Mick. My name's Dara Kelly, and I'm a partner in the corporate finance team at Grant Thornton. I'm going to talk through the current uh, funding environment for raising finance. Um, uh, and, you know, first of all, I'll set the, set the context and then talk about what we're seeing um, and just the observations, you know, over the past 12 months, it's, it's, it's been a very, uh, you know, exceptional time. I think we're all, we're all getting sick um, with dealing with the uncertainty of it, but, but it's something that all our clients are facing. And, um, uh, you know, there's, there is some, there is some, some insights and some, and some you know tools we can bring uh, to try and help them through it. So just to set the to the context, with some economic KPIs there, but really, um, you know, all of those macro issues are feeding into into 
one way or the other are feeding into pricing and feeding into uh, underwriting criteria um, across all the lenders, especially the pillar banks. So like, what are the, what are the main challenges? Well, number one, Brexit, we, we all knew that was coming and we'd like, you know, some clients were more advanced in their thinking and prep for it. Um, others a bit more reactive. Um, and then, and then of course, you know, 12 months ago, COVID arrives and brings, a complete shock to um, you know to to the economy and to the businesses and um, you know what we really have seen over the last twelve months uh, I think is 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 a two track or potentially three track but definitely two track economy where you have some businesses that have had exceptional years uh, exceptional year to date um, in that they have um, seen revenues increase. Um, and costs have costs have actually contracted across nearly near, nearly all of the businesses all that, that we work with because you can't spend you know simple things like sales and marketing uh, travel all of these cost items have come down but their revenues potentially have still um, increased or potentially jumped significantly uh, probably exceptional um, spike in revenues um, like businesses in med tech medical consumables financial services, pharma, um, have all performed extremely well. I think a theme with a lot of these businesses is, is that they are selling to customers internationally as well. So it's not just domestic uh, customer base, international customer base has really been a good, you know, has been given them great um, platform. Um, but then at the dramatic other end of it, you have, you know, hospitality, um, Irish to Irish businesses that are that are, that have been restricted due to the lockdowns, and and really they have struggled to to get any revenues, and essentially have been trying to to temporarily pause their businesses, um, take advantage of whatever government uh, support is there, and then try and assess when they will be able to ramp back up again. And it's that uncertainty that is the real issue. And when we get into the discussing about funding now um, is the real challenge. So, um, you know, I think the government reacted quite well, you know, initially back this time last year, we had the wage subsidy supports, which have, which have been very powerful, I think, um, you know, revenue reacted well, warehousing, be it that the that, that liability is still on the balance sheet. Um, and then obviously the banks gave them, um, the payment breaks and moratoriums, which <clears throat> three big pillars of support, but you, two of those pillars left liability, you know, the liabilities haven't gone away. Um, so th this is all now going to unwind into how, you know, businesses set themselves up for their funding over the next 12, 24 months. And that, I suppose that's, that's, that's exactly what we're trying to figure out. What is the, um, what's the best way to go about that? There's other macro things like, international trade and tax policies but you know if we if we just focus on the on the main you know next six to 12 months issues you can see there in the labor market supports the pandemic the the you see the first lockdown see the second lockdown if we extrapolate it out you see another another spike in, in january um so what is the recovery going to be like the the you know, when we sit down with our clients, what we're trying to figure out is what is the funding slash cash flow working capital requirements over the next 12, 24 months? And what, therefore, what, what facilities do we need in place? And therefore, what are we asking for and who are we asking for the support, right? Now, I don't, you know, these are four examples of what potentially could happen. I think the two on the left is what we'd all like. The two on the right are probably more more re potentially more realistic, definitely going to be more downside to them. A slower recovery than we'd like, is that going to happen to U-shape? Are we going to have an up and a down depending on whether there's an, how quickly we get out of this lockdown? Um, so uh, the, the, the issue is uh, timing for a lot and how quickly will, how, how quickly will it take for the run rate of revenue to catch up to the run rate on costs because you can't you know you can't just switch back on revenue although in certain sectors potentially we'll see a big rush but we, we we can't bank on that we have to make sure that we can cover our costs as we build back up the business again 
Um, and then we've got some other issues such as supply chain. Has that been damaged during the, you know, do we need to look at alternative sources of, of, of supply into the business? Because you've got the lead time then of a customer order comes in and if we can't turn it around because we're having supply issues, that has a knock-on effect onto our cash flows, which is ultimately where all of this mess ends up as the timing of the cash flows. And then when you're trying to explain to a lender as to how you will guarantee payment terms and there's questions over your cash flow timing, you know, it's circular reference, you're back into problems again. And interestingly enough, managing workforce, um, there's been a bit in the media about will certain bars and hotels and restaurants open again? Um, like talking to clients, it's, it's holding on to good staff is becoming a bit a serious issue and whether they'll have staff in place and that kind of flux of staff um, is a real challenge for, for some clients. Um, so that's another consideration. And then obviously retail really, um, if you know, had to embrace the online platforms um, and ramp up their websites if they hadn't already got that e-commerce channel, because we're probably looking at permanent changes in buyer behavior. Uh, if it wasn't already coming, you know, and, and our clients with um, high street retail were, were fighting that challenge anyways as as we came through so so that's that this is the uncertainty and um and what we have also noticed is some clients got very proactive at the start of of the even if their revenues came down they they went at their costs and tried to really manage down costs other clients i think not froze but just paused and were more reactive and although they were giving getting a lot of supports and the cash flows looked okay. They might have been cash positive um, on a cash flow basis. They didn't really do it as much as they could. And now they've got um, issues with the balance sheet. Like Angus would have covered this, and it's you know it's uncertain as to how this is going to play out because they didn't do as much as they probably could have done. And to be fair, that was you know it was a, it was a massive shock to everybody when when it did happen. So it's now trying to figure out, well, what do we need finance wise to, to be able to get back up and running um, with a sufficient funding platform? So what, what are the options? Well, the good news is a lot of options. Um, I suppose starting with our pillar banks, they were very well capitalized coming in uh, to uh, COVID-19 pandemic, which is something that's it's probably been lost now at least 12 months ago. So that was that was that was a positive. But of course, um, you know, they're very cautious on, on what further credit they put out into the market. I, we see a trend of them supporting um, existing customers, obviously, and they'll do that uh, to the extent they can. But new lending, um, you know, is cautious. Um, I suppose we have the change in that we've got Ulster Bank coming out. Mick mentioned it. Um, we're getting a lot of requests from clients with Ulster Bank um, debt t- as to what are their options. It look, it's pretty simple. Um, we'd recommend you um, look at, 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 at refinancing that. It's, it's kind of that simple because you get in, build a new banking relationship, you know, with a new pillar bank if you can. And, um, you know, and then you move on. You obviously don't want to be part of a loan sale. But you do have the protection of your loan documents. So if you're within, you know, within your covenants and you're within your, you're making your payment obligations, you have the protection of, of your loan documents. Um, but the, you know, the obvious thing is to refinance out and get out ahead of it. Um, so we have a lot of inbound queries on that. Uh, I think we'll see more of permanent TSB as well. They've done a tie up with Bibi for cash flow um, invoice financing. Um, but they're pushing the corporate um, loan book, so you know another you know good to have another um, another option um, as opposed to really just looking at a, a smaller number of domestics. So then you're moving into the the non traditional. I suppose the big one of the comments there is um, Pepper Money left the market, but there's still a lot of option and into all the alternatives. So what what we'd say is it's probably a match for nearly every situation across the business life cycle in that, in that page. But what you get into is the further you move right, you, you, the, the higher the interest rate goes and potentially you're losing um, equity slash control um, 
depending on how much equity you give away when you start moving into the private equity. The private equity guys, we've seen, I've done a page next as well, but we're seeing a huge amount of activity from them. Um, but obviously you need to be a business of a certain size or certain potential size slash scale for them to get interested. And, you know, the alternatives, there's a lot of opportunity, a lot of options there. And it's about picking the right one for your own business. Um, so there's a lot of property lenders still in the market. Um, we thought we'd see probably still maybe see a bit of consolidation if they don't get enough debt out into the market that we might see a bit of consolidation, but there's, there's a lot of choice. So just to touch on the private equity, I'm not going to talk about any of the deals only to say like the sectors, manufacturing, financial services, healthcare, engineering contractors, tech, um, high volume of deals, I think is the most interesting takeaway from that client. So there is, um, there's a lot of appetite and the private equity clients we work with, I think what they got was um, the most when they're looking at businesses now is it's been like the greatest asset test of all time is how did the business perform through COVID-19? And if they're still looking at businesses that are coming to market now and they can show that they held up through COVID-19, it gives massive um, confidence to, to the buyers because that is, you know, it's a great test and therefore they feel like they're getting into a, 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 a bit, you know, a very resilient business. Now we're, the, the, the knock on effect of that is we're seeing that the pricing is going up. Um, there's more competition and there's more peas chasing the right type of, um, of investment opportunities, which is great for, for the existing, you know, shareholders who are looking to maybe sell a portion or, or complete to completely sell out but just the, it's the volume of activity that i thought was interesting just to put in the context of the of the more negative um uncertainty of the previous slides so current trends um and just to talk a little bit more around the detail well look struggling sectors don't need to tell anyone on this call what the struggling sectors are i suppose there's nuances within each of the sectors which are potentially unfair being unfairly treated like an obvious one we've seen just very recently is um outdoor adventure business looking to expand profitable but is being you know put in the same bucket really as as um leisure and hospitality um which which is really ruling them out of being uh, get receiving um pillar bank funding um so so is that you know is is that sec is that element of that sector not going to come back quicker than maybe you know uh, indoor hotel business, yes, it is, but um, but they're struggling to get funding now. That's at the pillar bank level. They can they can they can push out into the into the more flexible lenders, um, but of course the interest rate's going to go up along with that. COVID uncertainty is just timing. So when when are we track? When are we projecting um, revenues to come back? And I'll talk about different scenario analysis now in a minute. It's probably the most important piece on this presentation is to get right when you're talking to lenders, but it's the uncertainty. So uh, what is the timeline and what will the ramp up be like? And will there be a spike and then a drop off depending on what sector you're in? Um, so that is the real challenge when we're trying to figure out what kind of repayment obligations um, you know, we should be asking for from, from lenders. Then on the... Um, on the funding parameters, look, interest rates are jumping around a lot, depending again on risk profile. We're seeing below 3%. Regularly, we're seeing up to 4.5%. Four, four um, you know, uh, it, it, it's down to the view on the sector. Um, we are seeing the banks kicking out um, interest only um, terms. Now, there's a bit of complexity to it, in, and they need to be confident um, that that the debt could ultimately re be refinanced because we don't want to just look for interest only terms in a context that would put us into um, the wrong profile of, of customer. And there's a word forbearance that no one wants to no one wants to be associated with a business because it affects your credit rating and things like that. So we need to just be careful on that. But but that is happening. Um, you know, banks are looking at everything case by case, but they will support existing customers on an interest only basis in certain circumstances. The debt, so the leverage is the, is the big thing. Leverages are coming down where we'd previously see 
debt to EBITDA of you know a very acceptable four, five or six times. They're now looking for four times. Again, it's 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 just been that bit more cautious. And the debt service cover, you know, is 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 the ask there is going up again, um, up to one, you know, one point four times in certain instances. So, again, it's just a bit of a more cautious lending. Now, this, the way to think about it is, this starts at the pillar, and then we extrapolate our, extrapolate our way out into the alternative lenders, where all of these parameters go up, but of course, interest rate goes up as well. And then the moratoriums. I thought it was interesting that this didn't become. Um, more topical in the media, actually, in the in in January in the third lockdown, um, but but it just didn't it didn't get any airtime as it did in the first. Um, now, what you know, so 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 there wasn't more payment new payment breaks in, introduced, but we of course have to deal with the pickup of the unpaid capital from the previous run of of um, of payment breaks, and that of course is feeding into uh, feeding into the the way we're running out the cash flows now, looking out for the next couple of years. So challenges. Um, first challenge is that you you know you don't get put in um, the way you present the business and in its wider sector uh, is very important, right? When when we're putting together a funding application, because the banks are taking sector views. Uh, there's always a I suppose a bit of flexibility, but you've got to make the effort to try and explain. Um, exactly where you think they sit within the risk profile of sectors. Um, so are they at the lower end of a risk profile in a sector that might be considered risky, but you've got mitigating factors, um, which you need to push those forward, right? Because, um, you know, it's really important to get, the, get that piece right starting off with. Identifying the funders, that, you know, there's a bit of don't waste time here as well. Um, there's sector risk, there's pricing tolerance of your client, um, which usually is a function of, 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 of the sector risk, and then what kind of security we have on, on offer. So we need to just, um, you know, you need to get the right combination there. I think it's becoming more important now because people are getting generally very frustrated with, um, with, 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 with all processes. I think there's a lot of fatigue going around. So just trying to make sure we're, we, you immediately pick the right cohort of lender um, to start engaging with. And then this is, this is, I think, the most important thing. There's a lot of scenario analysis going on with the, um, which is general uncertainty. So the key thing is when you're setting your base case scenario, do not be too negative on it because all that will happen is they'll run downsides. All the lenders will run downside scenarios in that. So if you were too conservative with your base case and they introduce a downside, you'll fail the tests that they said internally around debt cover service ratios and things like that and leverage. So you need to not be overly optimistic, but we need a, a proper base case um, because that's the one thing I'm seeing as a trend is that we're failing on the stress testing because we're being too prudent. And we did an example there where a business um, put together a, a set of projections. We challenged it with the business. They were happy to keep it. We put it to the lenders and the lenders said, no, we're failing the stress test. And what actually happened in the first quarter of trading is that the business doubled the revenue that we had projected. Now, all that happened, all that did was delay getting the debt, but that, you know, that, that wasn't helpful because it caused other issues around the level of, um, of, 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 of debtors that the business was building up. So we turned into a working capital issue. So just that's, that's, don't be too negative when you're setting your base case because it does come back. Then just some, on, on some other tactics um, where we have um, you know, balance sheet light, right? So more, more SMEs, more of a cash flow businesses. So look, look at the non-traditional um, lenders, it's going to be pricing, okay, and whether they like the sector, but the pricing is going to be higher than traditional, so are we happy with that? Tr traditional banks, it's more around it's what security we have and what leverage um, we're asking for, so again, are we going to be wasting our time there, or should we just go straight into the, into the traditional? And then on the private equity, um, well, number one, we need to be big enough, or the opportunity to be big enough, and number two, our shareholders and our clients need to be comfortable that they're going to give up a little bit of equity and that you know that that can get very emotive 
Um, but there might be obvious things that we're just not thinking about, such, such as succession planning, that that could come into play, and maybe potentially it is. Um, you know, there's a whole host of different strategy from private equity that some are are are, are very patient to hold a position for quite some time. So maybe you know, maybe they should be looked at closer now. Just some quick thinking outside the box. Um, asset leasing, if we've any assets that aren't encumbered. Uh, release some book debts. I've done a I've done a slide on working capital management at the end, but these are these are additional sources of finance, and then any non core assets that could be sold to to release some cash in for the business. Like all, all there's a I think that we should, all clients should be going through the discipline of this just to understand that they're not tying up any value in assets that could be used to, to fund the business. Um, some useful initiatives um, over the last 12, 12 months, like Enterprise Ireland, we saw a lot of clients avail of the, of the financial planning grant. We worked with a lot of them. The Sustaining Enterprise Fund that's closed now to new applicants, but we, we raised a lot of money through that for clients. On the SBCI, it was the credit guarantee scheme still in play. Um, and that's the, the more important one there, the future growth loan scheme, I think it's full and intertrade then have some, have some supports that should be looked at. So all of this should be looked at, um, you know, to get any, to get some obvious supports in when you, and, and also helps put together, you know, business plans and um, financial models. So coming to the actual engaging with the lenders for funding. So this is what we do a lot on, on business plans and, and more importantly, the financial models. So just do's and don'ts again, bottom up approach, um, key um need to need to build up the detail from historicals and there's no harm looking back into 19 to get your grounding principles if you're projecting out next year because you're you're recognizing that 2020 was a strange year potentially you're going to have to bring some of that strange year into into 21 as well run the scenarios this is again scenarios do not be too negative on your base case scenario you will fail the the stress tests uh, and and that's the the number one issue i think um, number one learning from 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 my section today. Um, don't assume that the reader knows your business that well. So you do have to do the make the effort of of building up the picture, and um, and be realistic when you're looking at projections. Um, we're not just going to immediately get back to the run rates we were pre-COVID. So um, you know, I think that there is obviously profitability margins and things like that we can build in, but just be sensible when you're building out the revenue. And then don't, you know, they're, they're fairly self obvious. Don't, don't be too high level. Don't be short on detail when you're, when you're, when you're asking the reader to make big jumps in assumptions without bringing them along the story. Um, and, 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 and don't just blindly follow past trends, um, assuming they're going to happen out into the future. And um, we did a lot of this back about 12 months ago, but I still think it deserves another um, mention coming in, you know, coming out of quarter one. Spend spend time looking at your own working capital levers. So these are basic things you can look at in your, in, in well, recommend your client looks at all of these in their own business because you, would, you wouldn't want to be standing in front of a lender asking for finance. And there's some obvious things that you should have looked at yourself because that just, that just introduces, um, a bit of uncertainty as to their confidence in, in, that you're going to perform on your business plan if if you're not just making sure you've got the the house in order from b before you enter into a new funding agreement so there's some obvious things to look at there i won't go through each of them but again it could be very helpful for unlocking some cash but so you know in conclusion th there's a lot of uncertainty um all we can, you know, do is build sensible, um, ask for credit, make sure we're asking the right person, understand that the more risk profile we are, the higher the interest rate goes. And, you know, private equity is always an, an option in the, in the right context. Um, and that's really, that's really an overshot on it today. So happy to take any questions. I'll pass over to Mick. Yeah, thanks Tara. The that was really positive. Um, we have a bit of negative and a bit of positive today, but um, it was good to end on a positive note. Look, I think we've run a few minutes over at the moment. Uh, we don't have any questions in the Q&A. Uh, we will be circulating the slides uh, after the presentation. Um, so, and feel free to come back to us directly or, um, in with any questions or any queries in relation to what, has, what we've gone through today. It's very comprehensive. 
it's the good and the bad. Um, it just it's just reflective of a two tier economy that's going on at the moment. Um, but look, um, there are an awful lot of positives out there, even in the restructuring arm where solutions can be found to difficult problems. Um, so thank you for attending. Uh, really appreciate it. Uh, have a lovely remainder of the day and um, stay safe. Thanks very much. Bye now. Yeah.